Hello, I'm here with baritone and composer extraordinaire Roderick Williams, who features in Private Joe on my new Heartfelt album. Roddy, it's so lovely to see you. How it's are you? It's great to see you too. I'm very well, thank you very much. Very well. Great, great. We go back a very long way, don't we? Really long. A year or two. A year or two. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I was trying to think when I first met you, but um, uh, it's probably about 20 something years ago, but um, it's gone by in a flash. And so I'm yeah. so pleased that you've done this because you do Private Joe just brilliantly and um and i just first my first question really was how did you get involved with the disc have you worked with the Sacconis before yes i have i think i was with them on their first recording which considering the Sacconi quartet is one of the hardest working bands in rock and roll i think it's quite a milestone so we recorded for naxos the uh, by footpath and style by gerald finzi at um potton hall many years ago um and of, of course, I've, I've been in connection with them kind of ever since. Our paths keep crossing. I keep meeting them various events here and there uh, and, and working with them. And we had plans to perform by footpath and style again very recently. Um, uh, but unfortunately, COVID got in the way of that. We will again, you know, never say never. But, uh... <laughs> good, good. I think um, one of the things about Private Joe is it's not just a song cycle it's actually um it's a, a true story um about a young soldier 19 year old private joe wood in the first world war and the piece was originally commissioned by baritone nigel cliff whose great nephew he was and nigel found these two letters from private joe to his sister mary who was nigel's grandmother from the front and the first letter is very chatty send me a food parcel are you keeping an eye on my girlfriend kind of thing um but the second letter only six days letter, later is absolutely devastating it's clear that he in those six days has seen some really traumatic things and had some hideous experiences. And, um, and so in order to set those letters, I couldn't just set one and then set the mm. other and I had to fill it in the middle. But that means for you that you have to be 19 year old Private Joe from Huddersfield in the first and last movements, but you're you're different people in the middle. Mm -hmm. And first of all, I wanted to ask you how you got into being Joe, because um, you're amazing. You do um, sing in a Huddersfield accent. How do you do that, and how hard is that? What that what does that demand from you? Well, it, it, being it being. A character or in character is something that I enjoy anyway. I do that on the opera stage. I do that a lot on the song stage. Um, often in recitals, I'm many different characters, song by song. But you mentioned Nigel, the baritone Nigel Cliff, and I know him. He's he's been a chorister at the Royal Opera House Covent Garden for some time, and I love seeing him, him whenever I'm there. Um, I've got a few stories, but that's possibly once the recording button's off. Anyway, sorry, Nigel, but but actually, uh, I have a, a recording, a, a live recording of Nigel singing this, and because of his personal family connection through to Joe, um, it's very easy for me actually to kind kind of imagine Nigel in Joe's place, and Ni that's that is Nigel's natural accent. Anyway, bits of it that he can put it on more when he wants to, and and then dial it away when he when he wants to, and so I can hear it in him. In a sense, I have a picture of Nigel singing it in my mind, and that was my my way in. I think a lot of actors talk about having trigger words in accents, like mm -hmm. you know, for Geordies, it's photocopier, you know, <laughs> so for, for it's a particular trigger trigger word. And for me, the sound of Nigel's performance, which I was growing used to as I was preparing the piece was a, a very useful handle. And then the other movements that you're talking about, um, uh, uh, they're, they're, they're different characters, completely different characters, different situations. And it gives me a chance then, as I would in recital playing different people, to, 
to drop a persona, pick up another one. Um, but I mean, the easiest thing for me in that sense is that is that that's the, the music act as my guide. Then, so you know, a few bars from the uh, from the, the the quartet, particularly in your second song. Just open a bottle of when I die. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Very easy to get into character for that one. Yeah. Uh, The music then sweeps me along in that way. Yeah. So that second movement and when I die is a traditional drinking song from the First World War, and um, and actually it's a I do a big sort of parody um, of it, and you're immediately within the space of seconds having to go from Huddersfield to Cockney Um, (laughs) and it's incredible how you do that and then um, the other um, feature the USP of this part is the quartet have to sing along with you how was that how was that well that that is that was great because of course um, they are probably feeling as self-conscious singing in front of me as I would be if I offered to play the cello in front of them. However, because the because of the nature of the piece, and it's, it's got a it, it, more is most definitely more. Yeah. Uh, so once once they'd he- heard me sort of uh, um, slaughtering my vocal cords in the in in in, in for art for art's yeah. sake, uh, they had full permission to join in in, in, in spirit, uh, which they did with such gusto, particularly, I have to say, the two women, yes. Anna and Cara, uh, yeah. who were just giving it such, such, such loudly. And what, what I noticed in recording is actually they began to give more and and the gentlemen of the quartet, Ben and Robin, uh, were beginning, were a little bit more subdued. I thought that was brilliant. I love it. I love it. <laughs> It's such a treat. It's such fun to listen to. I I really enjoyed working on that with you all. And then we have the letter by Wilfred Owen, mm-hmm. which changes the mood. It starts off quite jokey, and it's um, about a man in the trenches writing a letter, or at least trying to write a letter to his wife, but he keeps on getting interrupted mm. by artillery fire and... Um, and there's a lot of banter at first with the guy next to him, you know, give us a cigarette and he's sharpening his pencil and it's all very sort of mundane. But the second interruption, he actually gets hit by this artillery fire. And um, and again, that requires a lot from you because you've got to sing as if you've just had a hole blown through you, basically. And, and you do it brilliantly. Um, but... But was that difficult to sort of kind of pull that mood through all those different things? Because they were quite sudden changes. Yes, it's quite sudden changes. But from your point of view, you've written it like a short scene. Uh, And so the poem reads like a short scene, like a story, but but very much to the the extent where you're almost writing in the sounds of the pencil scratching on the paper. So it makes it very specific, it makes it very cinematic almost. So I can see where I am, I can see the circumstances, I can imagine the, the, my fellow soldiers, you know, um, teasing me as I'm trying to write and concentrate on something. So that makes it specific and very easy to do, much less abstract, much more focused. Uh, we, I don't remember, if you remember, we recorded that towards the end of the session so that I had the, um, the, the vocal uh, um, reserves left mm-hmm. Uh, to sing the other movements. Doing this in sequence, um, uh, I can't necessarily let go quite so much at the end of that, that song as someone who's just been, uh, been, been freshly wounded. Um, I can't yelp in quite the same way because it, it hurts a bit. But we'd managed to get everything else in the can by that point. Yeah. And, and, and so um, you know, I was invited to let it all go. And I think I did. You surely did. You surely did. It was wonderful. And then we have a beautiful poem by Alec Waugh called From Albert to the Poem. And it's about this um, war-torn field in Ypres. And um, interestingly, it was written almost exactly the same time as Joe's second letter. Um, And that was a happy accident. Mm -hmm. it's very beautiful and it's about the desolation of a of a field with um with burnt wrecks of trees and trenches and yet 
amongst all that brown and black and the gray sky and the, the brown mud, there are these blazing red poppies, mm -hmm. but they just drive home, um, you know, the, the color of blood of the victims of that war. And it's very beautiful, but already you had to convey a sense of desolation but not completely because you had to save something for Joe's last letter, mm -hmm. which you do absolutely beautifully. And mm -hmm. sorry, I interrupted you. No, not at all. No, no, I was, I was actually just, that was a, a murmur of agreement there. And there's just, um, uh, I think we are all of us used to that image of battlefields with stumps of trees and mud and barbed wire and, uh, you know, and rain and, rats and what, what have you um i had never really been out to those um battlefields before but at uh, uh, in 2017 i think it was i made a trip to ypres um uh, for a commemoration there and i had a little bit of time i had a higher cast so my wife and i went out and uh, and visited some of the um the the grave sites and the battlefields and and because at that time there were British British royalty were there, uh, so some of the main sites were cordoned off for security reasons. So um, we took a road out of Ypres and found a little thing that said it was a museum. It wasn't a museum, museum other than it was actually just a line of trench that someone had sort of said, you know, put put a euro in here and you can wander through. And there are bits of discarded shell around. You can just climb in and out. It's it's no one's going to move it. It's all just still there. It was the most chilling thing. There was a pillbox that we found, which was pockmarked by bullets from both directions because the the line had changed. You know, they, they, were, they were fighting over just 10 or 20 metres, and that's it. And the line had changed so often that when the pillbox was, was captured, it became the offensive um, pillbox in the other direction. So the door was in the wrong place. Mm. You know, obviously you, you enter a pillbox from the rear, but if that suddenly becomes the front, it's all a bit awkward. So just looking at these bullet holes in this in this concrete and just thinking that that's real. There's people ducking, trying to get in and out of this. It's it's so horrifying. So yes, all of that, all of that comes across yeah. in, in your fourth song. Just ah, an icy feeling of yes, icy feeling. Yeah, and in fact, I I there is a musical instruction for the strings to be icy. They they've got icy. very exactly. high up. Um, harmonics and they're very glacial and very cold um, and that's how we, we set the mood mm. and then of course we have Joe's final letter and Joe he's desperate he's lost everything he's lost his wallet he's got no money he's got no cigarettes he's got absolutely nothing he's um, clearly really 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 homesick um, desperate to be sent stuff and he says remember Mary we boys are, are fighting for you at home and and he so he's really aware of of what he's doing and you feel that because he he was very conscientious and I know this because um, because Nigel never met Joe because obviously mm. he died in 1917 um, we actually took the two letters to a graphologist who bizarrely is also called Roderick Williams. I think that's <laughs> such an I did notice that, that you mentioned that at the school. It's not yes. you, it's not you, but yeah. it's this other Roderick Williams who was amazing. He he painted a fabulous picture of Joe, somebody who's really conscientious, really good at following orders, so ideal soldier material, but mm. also could be quite stubborn and pugnacious but also very emotional. And you can see, um, Roger was showing in the letters how, on the second letter, um, he starts, the line starts in a sort of ordered mm. straight line, but then it kind of falls away. Um, mm. And you have sentences only sort of half finished. And mm. um, so, you know, a lot of it, when you listen to it, you think, oh, this doesn't make sense. But yes. that's because he, couldn't make sense yeah and um and so and we've got it's basically the same music as the first letter but obviously more traumatized mm. and um and I was very aware of the fact that I'd given you when he's 
he's saying, please send me something. And I've given you quite high notes there. Um, but, but, um, but did I say to you, and apologies if I didn't at the recording session, did I say it doesn't matter if you don't make a beautiful sound on that because he's in distress? Did I say that? I have a feeling that you said it the other way around. I think that what you said, if I may say, but I'm not trying to blow my own trumpet, I think you complained that the sound I was making was too beautiful. Yes. That, that you wanted something that had a bit more um, a, a, a pleading to it. And um, and uh, so in something like that, the use of something that's in the high, just a generally speaking, slightly higher part of one's testatura is, is simply a way of, of trying to, to find that. It, it's very difficult to, to, to plea and say, please, please, would you, please, would you? You, know, you just yeah. naturally put it higher in one's voice. So again, they're like, you know, that's, that's the opera composer in you. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> 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 or, or just the drama queen the dr <laughs> <laughs> well there's plenty there's certainly plenty of drama I I in those pieces particularly uh, for for any singer to have a journey a journey arc in a piece is always v v very rewarding you get the chance to um, take a character and take that character place to places so to be able to to frame the piece with the first and last song there and have him in one mood at the beginning and one mood at the end. And again, use, using, referring to the same music, but hearing it differently mm. and having a lot of the same words, but hearing them differently. So you set them differently. So as you say, he's, he's quite, he's full of get up and go in the first song and he becomes so distracted in the second, as you say, it sounds like a sort of word salad. He's, oh. The words are all there, but they don't seem to make sense in the same no. way. No, yeah. I I can't imagine what he must have gone through and what he must have seen, and and of course three weeks later he was killed in action, um, which is horrendously sad. But then millions were. It was mm. such a colossal, awful waste of life that that war. And it's interesting because I I um, read an opera recently. Um, which is about a present day soldier who'd been in Iraq and had PTSD. And there was a scene where um, they were reading and writing letters um, in, the, in a camp in the desert. And it was fascinating because obviously we used real letters as our source of inspiration. The content was pretty much the same mm. 100 years later, mm. wanting stuff to be sent from home, um asking how various people they know are and yeah. and um and and in the end as it is with um the trauma of war and ptsd the theater of war might be slightly different a hundred years later the methods but the emotion and the trauma is is still exactly the same mm -hmm. and um and i think i think private joe really really brings that brings that home mm. Mm. Um, but it, it's wonderful to have your voice on it Roddy and I you're so busy and I, I feel so privileged that you took the time out to learn it and to do it oh. I, I really hope we get a chance um, for you to do it live again and, yes. and also um, would be fantastic and it says a version with string orchestra as well yes so yes that would be that would be great you can imagine the drinking song with a whole orchestra singing absolutely yes yes i mean judging by the noise that the Sacconis made just just the four of them you know it's uh, i suspect that that anybody who 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 plays this will be singing that away as an earworm for some time to come <laughs> Roddy, it's so lovely to see you. Thank you, you too. very much for joining me for this interview. Always a pleasure, Rox. Always a pleasure. <laughs>